how do we shape the mindset? There are things we can do directly, right? We can help encourage more open communication. We can make it safe to fail, like you mentioned, uh, Bezos. But we can also help shape that through the technology and the practices that we do. It ends up becoming this virtuous circle where they kind of feed off of each other. Welcome to Future Squared, the podcast all about corporate innovation, entrepreneurship, and self-improvement. My name is Steve Glaveski, and each week I'll bring you conversations with thought leaders such as Kevin Kelly, Brad Feld, Steve Blank, Gretchen Rubin, Tim Harford, Adam Grant, Tim O'Reilly, Tyler Cowan, and many, many more on topics that will help you gain a distinct advantage, not only in the world of creativity and innovation, but in your entire professional and personal life. Each and every Friday, I'll bring you Fast Fix Friday, some short, high impact and easily digestible insights to have you finishing your week on a high. Future Squared is powered by Collective Campus, a corporate innovation school, consultancy and startup accelerator that works with large organizations to help them unlock their people's often latent potential to create more impact for humanity and lead more fulfilling lives. If your organization needs help coming up with ideas, testing and turning those ideas into reality, creating a culture of innovation, or partnering with startups, visit collectivecampus.io. So without further ado, let's get into today's podcast. Welcome back to Future Squared. Before I dive into today's guest introduction, I'd like to take a second to let you know that you can download our brand new ebook, The Business Case Alternative, How to Support Disruptive Innovation at a Large Company, for free over at bit.ly forward slash bizcase ebook. That's bit.ly forward slash biz case ebook. And now for today's guest. Today, I'm speaking with Nicole Forsgren. Nicole is an IT impacts expert who is best known for her work with tech professionals and as the lead investigator on the largest DevOps studies to date. She is a consultant, expert, and researcher in knowledge management, IT adoption and impacts, and DevOps. In a previous life, she was a professor, sysadmin, and hardware performance analyst. Nicole has been awarded public and private research grants, including funders such as NASA and the National Science Foundation, and her work has been featured in various media outlets, peer-reviewed journals, and conferences. She holds a PhD in Management Information Systems and a Master's Degree in Accounting. Nicole is CEO and Chief Scientist at DevOps Research and Assessment, also known as DORA. Her first book, Accelerate, The Science of Lean Software and DevOps, explores the topic of building and scaling high-performing technology organizations. I had a great time chatting with Nicole and learning about not only her Swedish ancestry, her favorite ice cream flavor, and her love for working out, which might have something to do with the ice cream, but learning more about what makes a high-performing team tick. You will learn lots in this conversation, including one, why traditional performance metrics such as utilization and lines of code are flawed and what to use instead, two, what characteristics differentiate high-performing teams from low-performing teams and how to start embedding these characteristics into your organization, and three, how to effectively drive culture change. This just scratches the surface of what we discussed, so please sit back, walk, run, or whatever it is you do when you listen to podcasts and enjoy my conversation with Nicole Forsgren. Welcome to the show, Nicole. Thank you so much. It's good to be here. Oh, it's an absolute pleasure to have you on the program. And before the show, I was wondering whether or not you're coming from Seattle or joining us from Seattle per your LinkedIn profile or Utah per your Skype profile, but you're in SF at the moment. Um, what takes you to SF? Uh, well, I, as my Twitter profile says, I'm probably on a plane. <laughs> so I, I travel quite a bit. And uh, Dora, so DevOps Research and Assessment, the company that I lead and I'm uh, chief uh, scientist for. Mm-hmm. Uh, most of the team is based here in San Francisco. And so we, we kind of rotate a bit through and I, I had a few meetings in San Francisco. So I'm here for a couple of days. I love the city. Awesome. Yeah, no, I love San Francisco. It's very much like Melbourne, just with a lot more tech startups. Yes. Well, <laughs> in Melbourne, I, some people may fight me for this, but I think Melbourne maybe has a better coffee culture. Oh, yes. Nothing. Look, I'm definitely not going to fight you on that one. I couldn't <laughs> agree more. Um, I've traveled to many a places, and I always look forward to coming back home purely to have a cup of Melbourne coffee. So you're, you're right on that one. And um, before we get into talking 
DevOps and software development methodologies and all that good stuff, have you managed to squeeze in a workout? Because from what I understand on your Twitter profile, you've been given the all clear to get back in the gym. Yes. Yes, I snuck one in. So Awesome. What kind of the, training? The day is off to a good start. So I, I usually do um, kind of a, a mixture of things, uh, CrossFit mm. and Pilates, and I'm starting to get back into running. So I had um, I broke my foot last year and then ended up getting plantar fasciitis mm -hmm. because I broke into it too strongly. Mm. So the yeah. running, I'm still – it's more of a bouncy walk right now. It's yeah. a very, very slow run. Hey, it's better than nothing. I mean I would really, really struggle with being sidelined from the gym or from any form of – physical activity for longer than say two days so i oh, can only imagine crazy. what it's like to be back back into it oh it's <laughs> lovely i'm excited once i can get back on the volleyball court so awesome. that's probably my favorite awesome love it well let's get into today's conversation nicole you're about to release your first first book right yes my yes. first uh fun book i first... guess a dissertation is sort of a book but let's not read that anyone yeah i have lots of academic articles my first book. Um, my co-authors, though, have several books. Yes, yes. Because sometimes I look at someone's Amazon profile and there'll only be one book there. But they're like, no, no, I self-published a bunch of books uh, back in the day. This is my 17th book. It's like, okay, sorry. Um, but the book is called Accelerate, the Science of Lean Software and DevOps, which you co-write, like you just pointed out, with Jez Humble and Jean Kim. So congratulations on your first book. Thank you so much. Um, so the book explores the topic of building and scaling high-performing technology organizations, and you spent a good four years researching this topic, I imagine, as an extension of the work you do with Dora. So tell us a little bit about um, the research to, to kick off with. Sure. So the research for this project in particular stems off of a multi-year research project that we've done in collaboration with the team at Puppet, mm -hmm. uh, and it comes from the State of DevOps report. So if anyone is familiar with that, it's been published over the last several years. Uh, the core team um, from Dora, myself, uh, Jez Humble, Gene Kim, we've been involved for the last four years. Um, I'm the lead investigator on this report, and this is the largest research study to ever investigate DevOps. So software development and delivery to help us really understand how we can drive value to organizations using software and using technology. Um, it covers, like you mentioned, four years. We have over 23,000 data points around the world. So we cover all technologies, uh, or I guess, you know, several technology stacks, like, you know, core broad technologies. We cover all industry verticals. And we look at this from a predictive analytics point of view. So some people are like, Nicole, help, what does that mean? What that means is, in contrast to other analyst research firms out there, so we're a complement to those research firms. So someone like a gardener or a forester, they do really important research. But the types of questions they ask are, what types of technology are being used? Mm. What is the market penetration for configuration management, right? What's the percentage of companies that are using um, microservices, right? The types of questions we ask are what practices and capabilities drive your ability to make software better? And then in turn, what things drive organizational performance or do they, mm. right? Like does making software at all or does making software better and faster actually make a difference in the bottom line? Yeah. Right. Because we like people, some people were like, oh, yeah, of course it does. And we're like, well, that hasn't super really been tested yeah. in really strong, rigorous ways. And so that's the type of research that we do. We touch on a couple of the other things, you know, like like what percentage of users are, are doing mm. X or Y. But we're really interested in understanding so that organizations can improve their organization, their customer satisfaction um, their value delivery in really, really smart ways. Yeah, so you're more focused on, rather than, as you pointed out, Gartner, looking at what is, you're more so asking the question, what does drive um, effectiveness in, say, software development and what helps teams perform at the top of their game. I might take a quick step back for some of our non-technical listeners who may be aware of the term but not totally familiar with the practice. DevOps is obviously, for us, um, a culture that and practice that aims to unify software development and software operations. But maybe if I just take a step back and just ask you, Nicole, why is 
the unification of operations with software development so important? That's such a great question, right? So it's, it's sort of because things are moving so quickly now. Mm -hmm. And also because we need to think about what it means for our users, right? So back in the day, let's think about how technology used to be made, okay? Mm -hmm. We had really long planning processes. We had longer software development processes. We had longer maintenance processes, right? We had what is what some people call waterfall. Yep. Some people call it phase gate, mm -hmm. right? It's just we had one step, and then you handed it off to the next step. You handed it off to the next step. You handed it off to the next step. That's just sort of the way it went. Mm -hmm. Well, then we needed to speed that up. So Agile came in. Uh, Agile is a fantastic methodology. The challenge with Agile is that it only captures really that developmental phase and that developmental process. And so, you know, to your question is, well, why do we care about operations staff? So the joke is day one is short, day two is long. <laughs> what that means is day one, we, we create the software and then we hand it off. We throw it over the proverbial wall and we let the operations folks maintain it. Yep. But how long do we maintain it? This is day two. Day two is long. <laughs> so we need to incorporate the operations folks into the conversations, the practices, the methodologies that are done by the development folks. Because then what happens if we find a bug, we find a process, we need to deal with distributed systems, we need to deal with complexity, we need to deal with scalability, because sometimes traditional dev folks were working on systems, you know, like the dev environment, which is not dealing with complexity and scalability issues that the operations folks are dealing with. So when you write something that works in a fairly constrained environment, of, not of course, eventually it works, and it's amazing, of course, this is great. You hand it off to a highly distributed, highly complex, very scalable system, and it breaks. Mm -hmm. and it's not your fault that it breaks, but it's going to break, and it's going to break in different ways. So you need to understand and talk to the people who can tell you the really amazing, really crazy ways this is breaking yeah. so that you can, one, fix it, and two, keep future things from breaking in that same way because we don't want to keep making the same mistakes. No. And the cumulative cost of that over time, you know, when you take into effect compounding and everything else is massive. And I guess to make what you've said a little bit more relatable as well for our non-technical audience, it's just like your typical siloed organization where you might have, say, a marketing team who's super agile and just wants to get shit done, as they say in the startup world. Yes. But they pass something off to, say, sales or finance or IT and maybe those parts of the business aren't as fast and therefore you can only move as fast as what's in front of you. So the rest of the organization ultimately pays the price because everybody's not aligned. Whereas if you align, say, development with operations, you can just be this, well, as well oiled a machine as possible as opposed to just being separated and like you said, day one being short but day two being incredibly long. Right. And then the operations folks, I want to point out, also benefit from this as well, mm -hmm. right? Our infrastructure systems, our operations systems are getting incredibly more, right, like I said, distributed, complex, um, highly scaled. And the methods that we used to use to maintain these systems benefit from more and more and more automation and more and more scripting. And so by chatting with your development folks and learning methodologies and processes from them, your own practice of IT operations work and infrastructure gets better. Now, I'm not saying IT operations folks need to become developers and, co and programmers, although they need to program. And I'm not saying that that means dev folks carry a pager all the time, although they get better by understanding what types of things break their code. And they do develop more empathy by being on rotation every mm. once in a while. Mm. And I think for the operations folks as well, it's... I know from personal experience, it just makes work a hell of a lot more rewarding when you can see the value of the work you're doing. I know in your book, you've um, uncovered some sort of, well, I'll call them some metrics of success between high performers and low performers, where high performers have, say, 46 times more frequent code deployments. They're 440 times faster. Well, their lead time is 440 times faster from commit to deploy. They are 170 times faster mean time to recover from downtime. And so when you're operating in that kind of environment, you're constantly shipping, you're constantly releasing updates to your customer. And in that case, you're seeing the value of your work rather than, like you said earlier, waterfall stage gate processes where you might 
not see any value being delivered in six months, 12 months. And even then, it might not be the most beneficial thing because you've not really built in any process for feedback or iteration. And it's just been, well, fingers crossed, this actually delivers what the customer wants. Right, exactly. So I tend to quote Peter Drucker a lot on this podcast, Nicole. So I'm going to quote him again. (laughs) Um, If we can measure it, we can manage it. And your book explores a number of topics, both on management and measurement. Keen to understand what kind of, well, firstly, what methods you compared in terms of um, software development frameworks and what were some of your key findings in this space? Because there's so much talk today about different, whether it's early stage, and I'm going to jump outside of just software development here, but I'm going to talk, you know, everything from, say, human-centered design through to lean startup through to, you know, agile, DevOps, lean, XP, peer programming, all this sort of stuff. There's so much out there that for an executive trying to make a decision and cut through all this noise, it can be challenging because there's a lot of talk, like you said, Gartner reports say percentage of companies doing X, percentage of companies doing Y, but not much out there on what is the most effective. So I'm keen to explore what you looked at and what were some of the findings. So you know what is, I think, the most important thing to think about is the best most innovative organizations keep getting better. Mm -hmm. And so what's most important to think about is the end goal. The end goal is delivering values to your, delivering value to your customers and your end users. So this will be true whether you are in a for-profit company, uh, whether you are in a not-for-profit organization, deliver value and find ways to deliver value faster, more reliably with higher quality. This will always be true. Now, some people are like, well, why faster? Because faster allows you to pivot when you need to pivot. It allows you to keep up with compliance and regulatory changes. It helps you delight your customers, right? So I'm, we have customers and clients at Dora that, are, that work with the U.S. federal government, right? So like this is clearly not profit motivated. And yet they have also found that speed works to their benefit. They can serve more customers better, faster, more reliably. They are more efficient. They are delivering on their mission goals better. Um, We have also found that speed and stability move together. If you move fast, the best companies move fast and are more stable together. Okay. So when you say what framework should you use, right? If the goal is speed and stability, What's most important is that you find ways to develop and deliver software with both speed and stability. Mm -hmm. Adopt the framework that makes sense for your organization. And I think this is where the book really highlights and the research really highlights what's most important because we have systematically over the last four years really tried to dig into and uncover what is most important here. And so we have, you know, we've identified several capabilities that are really important. Some of these include things that come from the lean movement. It includes things that come from the agile movement. It includes practices from Kanban and Scrum. Mm -hmm. It includes practices that are core to what people think about when they think about what DevOps is. It includes culture. It definitely includes... um, technical practices and automation. Whatever you want to call it, you can call it. Don't be pedantic about it. Don't be too rigid. Use what is going to really work for you, but be very smart about it. Yeah. And I think that's a slight deviation from some of the views you find in in the software development world where people are just say scrum evangelists and and they'll say no no you need to follow it to the letter of the law and if you're not doing it you're only practicing scrum but maybe that's fine because every organization is different and you need to take bits and pieces of different methodologies and do what works for you like you've pointed out there it could be using a kanban board using sprints um you know using some of the attributes that underpin lean and and agile like um small batches and continuous delivery and building quality in and automating stuff you just got to take the best of everything and apply that in a way that works for you well and the other thing that's really important is you will you need to apply what works for you and you need to focus on improving the things that are currently your constraints, mm-hmm. right? Which, which, if it's okay, can I take us on a tiny little tangent? I love tangents. <laughs> Let's do this. Because I think it relates, right? P- particularly for our executives and our leaders who may be listening right now. Mm-hmm. So often I get people come to me and they say, you know, what's my maturity? 
what's my DevOps maturity or what's my DevOps readiness? Can I even start? Or, you know, how do I gauge and understand my maturity? What's my maturity model? Mm -hmm. And you know what? Like, I'm going to break everybody's heart. Maturity models don't work. This is not the correct paradigm for something like technology transformation Mm -hmm. or whatever you want to call it, DevOps transformation or technology improvement. That's because I, I, is that because if you've got a maturity model, it implies that once you get to, say, a certain level of quote unquote maturity, you stop improving? That's, there are actually several reasons, but that's the one I always start with, right? Mm -hmm. They focus on helping an organization arrive at a mature state and then you declare yourself done. Mm -hmm. The challenge there is that that's not all, that's not the way it works. We've seen in the last only four years of data collection that every single year, the best keep getting better. And so, you know, we've done, so with Dora, we also offer assessments, um, which, which I only mentioned for this one example, this Mm -hmm. one specific case, we had a company that was doing quite, quite well. Um, and they were, when we benchmarked them against the rest of the industry, they were ranking quite well in regards to high performers. And then the next year's data set came out and they were suddenly, it looked like they dropped. And this was so fantastic to see how the leadership team responded. Some people might be concerned. Their leadership team said, this is great, right? Because now we know, right? We need to keep pushing. We need to keep driving. If you use a maturity model as a marker saying you've arrived and then you're done, that's not great. Now, yeah. we, what I some people are going to say, okay, what should we do instead? A capability model. So capability models help you focus on continually improving your capabilities because we then explicitly realize that the technology landscape and the business landscape is always changing. Mm -hmm. And so we just need to keep focusing on the right capabilities. Okay, so that was the first one. The second one is that maturity models are often a lockstep or linear formula, right? So we say that step one is a bunch of this stuff. And then you move on to step two, which is all of these other same things. And step three is all of these other same things. But it doesn't look like that in real life, right? Step one for one company is going to be different from another company. Mm -hmm. And so we can't prescribe the same set of technologies and tooling and capabilities and scrum processes for one company as we can for another because we're all starting somewhere different, which is why a capability model is nice because we can focus on the specific capabilities that are slowing us down right now we can focus on our bottlenecks or our constraints yeah and that capability model is a living breathing model that will adjust as you said with changes in business and the technology landscape exactly okay so that's the second one Mm -hmm. the third one is that capability models focus on key outcomes and how the capabilities drive improvement in those outcomes So if I say this another way, it's Mm outcome-based, right? So I said the key outcome is developing and delivering software with speed and stability. And by the way, an outcome of that is organizational performance, profitability, productivity, market share, effectiveness, efficiency, customer satisfaction. So we know that in order to improve our ability to develop and deliver software, we want to then improve our capabilities. It's very outcomes-based. Now, in contrast... Maturity models usually just measure a technical proficiency or like the install base of a tool and it doesn't really tie it to outcomes, right? We just, we just want to say like we have this percentage of test coverage or we have this tool installed on like this percentage of the teams, right? This percentage of teams are using this tool Mm -hmm. and then it ends up being a vanity metric. It's super easy to measure. Like the nice thing is that it's super easy to measure, but, but it doesn't help us get, like, like so what? I mean, it's nice, but, <laughs> oh, and, right, and? Yeah, and I know you talk about this in your book where um, you really stress focusing on outcomes, not inputs, and point out flaws in some of the traditional sort of metrics we use to measure the effectiveness of teams, such as um, utilization, velocity, and lines of code. 
Yes, right, which is why traditionally it's been so difficult to measure software delivery performance because those just aren't good measures. And and I I can see why companies do that because it's it's the easy thing to do, right? It's much harder to focus on the outcome. And we see this outside of software development as well where companies now are under pressure to say demonstrate that they're being innovative and they'll run things like idea challenges and the metric they use again it's a input metric it's a vanity metric and it's like well we ran this program and we got 700 ideas and it's like okay cool what happens though with those ideas are they actually do they turn into low fidelity prototypes you then go off and test the assumptions underpinning these ideas do some of these ideas actually become living right. breathing products that generate revenue or are we just focus on that vanity metric saying well we engaged the organization and everyone came up with all these great ideas but then it all fell flat and long term people stopped um, contributing to this campaign because they're just disgruntled that nothing happens beyond the ideas phase. So Exactly. Well, and you know what? I love that you, you pointed that out because there's two related challenges there and not everyone mm. understands this. And the two related challenges are one, you didn't tie it to a good outcome, right? It's a vanity metric. Yeah. Some of those things are amazing and wonderful, right? Because you do need to do something to generate a whole bunch of ideas, right? But then, like you said, tie it to an outcome. Are we looking for just like we need some kind of innovation? So all we cared about was a great brainstorming session and we're okay letting it die. Mm -hmm. Or we need to then tie it to prototypes, which then go to market, which then measure customer engagement or success yeah. or revenue growth or value delivery or something, right? So one is clearly articulating and defining measurement and value and outcomes and what that is. And then the second one is resources, are we going to tie resources to this? Now, resources are several different things. It can be money, mm -hmm. it can be time, it can be attention, it can be executive sponsorship. Is this something that is actually important and relevant and will receive resources? Now, now with the understanding that, you know, if we get three months in and we're like, this isn't working, we've changed direction, we all are fine with saying, you know what, this was a super cool experiment, but we're going to change direction because we are pivoting, mm -hmm. right? That's fine too. But if you like run the thing and it's amazing and you even have all of your metrics figured out and tracked that are outcomes based and three weeks later, there's nothing, there's no resources, there's no money, there's no training, there's no even time, right? You have no time during the day to spend on it. There's no, res there's no uh, executive sponsor. There's no, there's nothing. It, it, there's no, it's going to fail. Mm -hmm. It's not going anywhere. Yeah. So what you're suggesting there is that you need to make either the resources available or those two inextric inextricably linked whereby if you can demonstrate the outcome or that there are some positive metrics, you then make the resources available. Because I'm a big proponent of, say, metered funding for, say, new ideas or new software development projects. And if you can demonstrate that early success based on actually getting something out to the customer and based on that, it makes sense to make more money, time, attention um, available to pursue that project. Otherwise, it doesn't. I mean, what are your thoughts on that? Um, yes, and you need both though, right? Mm -hmm. Because you can't create something and do rapid prototyping and get it out to the customer without resources. Of course, of course. Right? And well, I love that you say of course, because so you, many of us are going to sit here and say, well, of course, you know, uh -huh. of course this makes sense. And yet so often I see these great ideas come up in like an internal hackathon yep. and they're like, this was amazing. Let's totally do this. Um, but you know what? This is totally a priority. And by priority, I mean, I am not going to deprioritize any of your existing work, find a way to make it fit, which means it's not a priority or everyone's expected to do it in their free time, right? Yeah. Like that's not resources. That's not resources. If you want to do a thing, then you need to do a thing. Yeah. And that's why we often see um, early stage innovation projects at large companies getting effectively the rug pulled out from underneath them, say a month or two in because something else, which is a quote unquote higher priority has come up. And usually it's something yep. that relates to the core business. So this little innovation project that's not really going to generate any significant revenue for us for maybe 12 to 24 months, if ever, let's just put that on ice for the foreseeable future. Okay. So that's another good point, right? 
sometimes we can come up with innovation projects that are going to deliver renov- revenue and value. Mm-hmm. See what we can do there. Mm. I've seen banks and financial institutions and people that, you know, organizations that we would think are really conservative and really stodgy and really boring come up with really fascinating ideas that are relatively straightforward and deliver something that's customer facing in a couple of months. Yeah. Well, this, this comes back to what you were saying earlier, Nicole, around speed and having an organization that just moves quickly. Like I even, if I think about, say, Jeff Bezos at Amazon, and he is a massive proponent of being fast as opposed to being perfect. And he says, you know what, sometimes you'll be fast and you'll get it wrong, but you'll still be quicker than the organization who takes 12 months trying to get things quote unquote perfect and still gets it wrong. So you can then learn from that customer feedback, iterate and get better. And he always says that failure is is inseparable from success. So by being an agile, fast moving organization, you're far more likely to be able to figure out which of these early stage innovations projects are worth investing in further exactly Mm. and i love that point Mm. and you know if there's anyone out there listening thinking i that that's not achievable right i'm gonna turn this podcast off now hang with me don't turn it off yet right (laughs) if they say like i can't move that fast it's not gonna work sometimes this is the perfect opportunity to do something like this on these small innovation projects yep you do is you set this aside and you say, you know what, for, for just this one project, it's okay. It's just this one project. Mm-hmm. We're going to break all the rules. Nothing that's like massively um, disruptive and not, by, not disruptive internally. I mean, disruptive, like don't break anything that violates SOX compliance or PCI DSS compliance, right? Yeah. I'm going with those because those are the ones I know um, in the states that are financial based, right? So stick with those, stick with the really big legal ones, but go ahead and break every other rule internally, right? Like you have to fill out seven forms to get something procured. Mm -hmm. You have to go through this board approval for, you know what? No, because it's only this one project. We're just going to see what happens, right? Like we have special executive sponsorship authority to, to waive almost everything just in this one case. Like, we'll document everything, we'll try to waive as many rules as we can for the sake of speed. And what happens is, you deliver value really quickly, you get something out the door really quickly, and you end up uncovering how many things are sort of unnecessary. They've been unintentionally introduced into the system as a way to try to reduce risk, right? So many of these things are there with best of intentions. But the research has also shown, and we, sh- we throw this in the book, things like change approval boards mm-hmm. are not predictive of performance improvements. And they're not even highly correlated with stability, which is interesting because so many times teams say, we know we're losing speed, it's okay, but we know we get stability. Four years, 23,000 data points across all industries, we don't see it. It doesn't show up in the data. We don't see it anywhere. And so what are you really sacrificing? Yeah. You're sacrificing a good portion of your core business. Yeah. Couldn't agree more. And I mean, a couple of things I wanted to touch on there. I mean, one is you've correctly pointed out having a isolated project. And I, I like to call that from Snowflake to Avalanche. And I've seen that play out in a number of organizations. Oh, where, oh that's good. I haven't heard that before. Yeah, you can also use uh, from Bonfire to Wildfire. But hey, you, you can you can totally take that one. <laughs> um, but I've seen that play out in so many organizations where one team may just start doing or start practicing, say, lean or agile or something just to see what happens. And oftentimes, if they do create or generate some value, then other teams say, oh, how do we go about doing that? But even if they don't, they usually get the learnings that they're after much earlier in the piece than they would otherwise. And just by having a case study that you can hold up as an example of what happens when you take this approach, it can build that momentum internally and it can get other business unit heads to start asking questions about, well, how do we start doing that in our division, which I've found quite powerful. So, And it's also a lot more achievable rather than, like you said, don't turn this podcast off because your organization isn't super fast yet. Like We're not talking about big bang transformation. We're talking about one team, maybe a one month long project, if that just try and see what happens and then share those learnings with other um, decision makers or other people in the organization. It's, it's right. such a huge thing. And, and then also what you said about change advisory boards, uh, stability. And like the common thread in this conversation thus far is that 
business landscape, technology landscape, it's moving quickly. You need to move with it. And your change advisory board process, it might keep your organization stable, but is being an organization that can't duck and weave with the with the punches really stable? Or is that, as you pointed out, going to cost you in the long run? Exactly. Mm. You know what else, something that came to mind is, you know, when we're talking about these small innovation teams and, and maybe someone, someone listening in thinking, oh, this won't work for my organization. Mm-hmm. We work on an older technology platform. We work in mainframes. We work in something. Um, another thing that we found across the research is that architecture matters, but mm-hmm. technology does not. So your technology or, or your technology stack isn't necessarily the limiting factor. We have seen organizations that work in highly regulated fields on old technologies, mainframe environments, make all of this work. And so what we found is that when we compare the low and the high performers, like specifically, if I look at low performers, low performers are more likely to be working on software developed by outsourcers, and they're more likely to be working on a mainframe system. But... Working on a mainframe system isn't statistically correlated with performance. And working on a greenfield or a brownfield system isn't correlated with performance either. Mm. So, okay, if it's, if it's not the technology stack, what is it? What we found is it's actually architectural systems and how your team is okay, team and technology, notice both those, how your team and how your technology is architected. Right. So can you give us an example of where an organization perhaps had, say, legacy mainframe infrastructure, but the way they were architected enabled them to perform at a higher level? Sure. So um, there, I'm trying to think of if I can name companies, Mm -hmm. federal defense contractor right now that's doing this and they're doing it quite well. Some of the core questions that I know we've highlighted some of these in the book. Let me repeat a couple of them because I think people listening along to the podcast could maybe identify this, right? So if your team, if your, if your core teams, or even on these innovation teams, right? Because you can think about this. Um, if the teams can make large scale changes to the design of the system without having to get permission outside of the team or without having to depend on other teams, right? Do you have to submit... Um, an architectural design for review, Mm -hmm. that's going to slow you down, right? That's not going to be an architecture that is, that's, um, allows for speed. Um, can your team work without fine grained communication and coordination with people outside the team? That's another one. Um, can the team deploy and release its product or service on demand independently of other services that it depends on. Yeah. Right. So that one, a lot of times people are like, Oh, you know, microservices, um, Docker, 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 (laughs) but that can be achieved through a service oriented architecture that can be achieved through API calls that can be achieved through decomposing your programs in such a way that they call other. So I used to work in mainframes, right? You can do this through subroutines, like really, really smart, careful use of subroutines and subcalls. Yeah. And, and it sounds like what we're talking about here is effectively changing the way people behave. And you've quoted um, John Shook, the CEO of Lean Enterprise Institute in your book, who said, don't change how people think, but change how they behave and what they do, which is in my interpretation, inextricably linked to process. And it appears that, I mean, I know in your research, you've hypothesized that the practice of lean and agile can have an effect on culture. And oftentimes when I hear people talk about this, when when I hear people talk about culture change, they're always thinking about, well, how do we get people to change their values, um, their mindset, all that type of stuff. But ultimately, if you put people in a particular environment where processes exist to help them, say, move quickly, where they don't have to deal with multiple business units and fill in seven forms to get something done and go through change advisory boards and everything else, then that will naturally have a flow on effect as to how they behave and act on a day-to-day basis. 
Yes, absolutely. And that's actually what Dr. Shook found, right? Is that by changing the environment, by changing the processes, by changing the work that people do. So by the way, this can be in the, in the lean practices they adopt, mm -hmm. in the um, agile practices they adopt. It can be in the technology that they use because the different types of technologies that we adopt um, enforce different types of things that we do, right? The technology decisions that we make change the way that we do work. That influences our culture. It influences, you know, like you said, sometimes people are like, oh, well, how do we shape the mindset? There are things we can do directly, right? We can help encourage more open communication. We can make it safe to fail, like you mentioned, uh, Bezos. But we can also help shape that through the technology and the practices that we do, which then feeds back into the technology that we do. Once we are in a better culture and a better environment that makes it safe to fail, yeah. It shapes the way we build software. It ends up becoming this virtuous circle yeah. and, where and they kind of feed off of each other. Yeah, and I mean, the software development world, I mean, when, when we're talking about processes dictating people's behaviors, I mean, you could just take that as a microcosm of, say, humanity today. I mean, if you compare the way we behave today with, say, two or 3,000 years ago, uh, where violence was usually the first form of response to any situation that left you feeling a little bit, uh, say, less than optimal. Today, because we live in a society, at least in most Western countries, where that's frowned upon, while it still oh. occurs, it's much less than what it was, say, even two or three hundred years ago. Oh, sure. I mean, even look at the advent or the, the proliferation of social media, mm. right? We have tweets that are 140 and now 280 characters. We are in, a, in an interrupt-driven society and my, you know, my, my grandmothers now, you know, lament the fact that we don't do as much reading or we have much shorter attention spans. Mm -hmm. That's been shaped by our environments. Our yes. technology shapes these things, which it wouldn't be a, a DevOps discussion without citing Conway's law, right? Mm -hmm. Organizations which design systems are constrained to produce designs which are copies of the communication structures of those organizations, yep. right? Which kind of brings us back around to that architecture piece I was just talking about. How we talk to people, how we uh, communicate with other teams, how tightly coupled that is, ends up being reflected in the technology that we build. And how tightly coupled that technology is ends up kind of being reflected in the communication patterns with other teams. Yep. And the faster our technology can move, the faster we can talk, it it really ends up kind of carrying through. Mm. And I love what you said there about the way people behave being a reflection of their environment, particularly when you talk about, say, technology um, and our, say, shorter attention spans and everything else. And, and it's so true and it's something I wholeheartedly believe whereby it's much easier to change your environment to support a particular behavior such as, say, Oh, I want to stop eating junk food or potato chips. Well, I'm just not going to have them in my house and therefore I'm much less likely to reach for them at you know, 9 p.m. when my willpower is that's, completely depleted. That's so real. Alice Goldfuss had the best tweet a few weeks ago. She mm -hmm. was like, past Alice wanted to eat better and and present Alice is so angry that all I have are raisins today. <laughs> <laughs> well, right? It's so real. Yeah, totally, totally. Um, you know, I, I was – looking at using my phone less and not looking at it, say, before bed or first thing in the morning. So I just replaced that as an alarm clock with an actual alarm clock. And, you know, over the course of a couple of weeks, you just wake up and you spend the first, say, 30 minutes of your day just not looking at your phone and you just go into your day much clearer. But it's much easier to do that when the phone is, say, not at your bedside table and it's in a, another room somewhere. So just change your environment to change your behavior. No, that's just crazy talk. <laughs> 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 um, Nicole, I wanted to um, just get your thoughts on QA because we have spent a lot of time talking about speed, but whenever I've talked about, say, Agile or Lean or anything like this to, say, your very traditional QA person who's been in that space for 20 years, only ever operated in a waterfall environment, wants to make sure everything is absolutely quote-unquote perfect before it leaves the building, they always cross their hands, cross their arms rather, and have massive reservations. So how does one go about building in some form of quality assurance into a fast moving well oiled machine? So QA is super important, right? Let's 
definitely make sure that God bless everyone in QA. Mm -hmm. They save us so often. (laughs) (laughs) They definitely save us so often, particularly when we're working in um, complex systems, right? The challenge the, the challenge shows up and more errors and more delays show up when we have several, several handoffs. And so I think the key here is when we can find ways to reduce as many handoffs as we can, right? So what we don't want to see is having multiple handoffs between multiple teams and highly siloed organizations or highly siloed you know, teams where we have you know, database administrators on one team, uh, developers on another team, network administrators on another team, system administrators on another team, infosec on another team, testing on a separate team, QA on a separate team, UX on another team, and everyone is completely, 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 completely separate. Yeah. If there's any way we can collapse some of those into cross-functional teams, it does several things. One thing that it does is it reduces the number of handoffs, right? Mm-hmm which introduces delay, which introduces a uh, possibility for error, which introduces a lot of different things. Another thing that it does is it helps us create better code, better tests, more empathetic users um, who are um, like cross-functional, right? We have T-shaped users who are then like experts in their area, but they're also broadly skilled, mm-hmm. which is like amazing and fantastic. And it makes our code and our, our code base better, it helps reduce technical debt because then we have a better understanding of what everyone else is doing, so we write more efficient code. Um, and then when we do get to QA, you know, occasionally that is going to be a por- and portions of test, right? There are some things that need to be manually tested. Um, that will sometimes still be a separate-ish group, right? But then when we get to that group, they are doing the things that cannot be and should not be automated, they are still probably, hopefully, very integrated with that like amazing collapsed cross-functional team. And they're in there and they are like the amazing SWAT team, yeah. right? They are doing only the things that that they can do that cannot be done through automation, right? Like we're not handing them things where they click buttons that are like annoying that could super be automated. So they are high value, they are efficient, they are fast, and the things that they find are amazing. So um, they also understand and they feel valued because they're identifying things that no one else found, and the rest of the team finds them immensely valuable instead of like, oh, why did you kick my code back again? It's like, oh my gosh, this was amazing. Thank you so much. Is there any way I could find a way, like how can you help me integrate this into my yeah existing test space, yeah. right? Because now you're a team instead of just one more hurdle. Oh my gosh, of course, QA found it. Ugh. Yeah, exactly. And it's it's more so about, it comes, I suppose, full circle back to what we we're talking about earlier around um, outcomes, not inputs. And your manual testing team is going to respond with value rather than with process. And where people yes. start to develop a bit of, say, antagonism towards QA or, or testers is where they're just throwing stuff back at them for the sake of it rather than saying, actually, this is a legitimate issue that needs to be resolved. And even like, look how cool this is. Look what I found. We didn't even re- think about this before. Yeah. And, and it even pulls us back into one of your first questions, right? Dev and ops, like why even integrate them? Why pull them together? Mm-hmm. Right. And how one of it was, you know, one of those outcomes was empathy and pulling teams together. Once developers and, and, you know, automated testers understand better what QA's job is and what they're looking for, you, you get two things. One is that you try to automate more of their work as possible so that QA's you know, job set gets smaller, not so they don't have a job, but so that they can do it even better. Mm-hmm. And second, you get empathy and understanding for what they're doing. And so you get this like awe of that is amazing. I had not even thought about that. There, I could not do that. Or like, thank you so much for helping make this product so much better. And then QA gets a better understanding for what Dev is doing. And like, oh, this, how did, how could this slip through the cracks? I could totally talk to you about this to help you build this into your tooling and testing environment. 
Yeah. Or, oh, yeah, there's no way your tool could ever get this because it's this weird, bizarre edge case. But look at how cool this is. I'm totally going to be able to find this for you. So yeah. we find it now and not at customers because that not only pisses off customers, but that is so much pain, right? Mm. Like that is so awful. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Couldn't agree more with you on that. And I guess um, what, one thing you touched on there was um, it gives QA, it gives testing a lot more purpose and a lot more respect from other parts of the organization and their two key attributes you've identified in helping people to avoid burnout because your book does go off and start and does look at how to make work sustainable and what can teams do to ensure that performance is not achieved through brute force or at the expense of mental health. So keen to understand outside of focus on purpose and respect, what else organizations can be doing to ensure that despite being this well-oiled machine, your people don't burn out. So I love that, you know, you touched on this as well, because this is another outcome, right? Mm -hmm. Some people think about outcomes in terms of only uh, customer value, shareholder value, profitability, productivity, market share. But like you said, invest, um, you know, the sustainability of our software development and delivery, our people is also super important. And what we have found is that investments in capabilities, right? Sorry, I'm gonna to touch back on that capability model, not maturity model. Mm -hmm. Investments in core capabilities that help you make software better and faster with higher quality do two things. First, they help you make software better and faster, right? Which helps you with the money thing and the efficiency thing. They also help decrease burnout they also help decrease deployment pain. They also help with identity at work. So identity is this thing where it's like, I, I feel like I'm a part of my team. I enjoy the work that I do. I feel good values alignment. So like my values and my team's values are my values and my organization's values are closely aligned which is important because um, other research, Christine Maslach um, is sort of the expert in burnout research. She has found that um, values alignment helps fight against and decrease burnout. And so like, here's another reason to make smart investments in developing your capabilities in cultural areas, in technical uh, automation areas, in process areas, in measurement and metrics areas, by making these smart investments in your ability to make software better, you also improve the work life of your professionals, so they want to stay with your organization. Yeah, it's 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 funny. Um, I'm prompted to think of uh, Frederick Nietzsche when he says um, or said that he who has a powerful why can bear almost any how. Um, and so when I come back to values alignment and purpose and respect and it all kind of comes full circle. And if you do have that values alignment and if you are working on a team where everybody is driven by a worthwhile mission and is aligned towards achieving that mission and is constantly seeing the results of their work, say on a weekly or fortnightly basis based on when every sprint goes out, that to me seems like an organization where you don't get burnt out because you actually enjoy the work you do because you can see the value you're creating and you believe in the work you're doing. Absolutely. And you know what? We also find that employees in high performing organizations are 2.2 times more likely to recommend their organization as a great place to work. Mm, yeah. So it helps you retain your employees. It helps you recruit more employees later just through great word of mouth. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. And I think that's a great point. Well, actually, we know we won't wrap up on that. The last question I had about the book was around what first step can companies take to embark on this journey if they haven't already, or if they are on that journey, what do they do? And of course, I might be hinting to a little uh, section of your book starting with S. Oh, well, I'm not sure which one you're hinting to, but uh, <laughs> I can guess. Uh, I might be talking about a survey. Oh, yes. Well, I will say, in general, for anyone, mm -hmm. right, you can always try to – well, actually, so I guess you're right. I mean, I was going to say you don't have to. Um, <laughs> but it's always important to understand where you are, yeah. right, because that lets you – you know, for years people would come to us and they would say, I wish I understood – 
you know, I wish I could like compare myself to everyone else. And then, you know, what should I do? And so with Dora, we do offer assessments. Um, and comparing yourself to the rest of the industry, I tell everyone that's sort of a party trick, right? Like that's nice, it's cool, but the best you're just gonna keep getting better. And even if you're behind, you need to get better. So everyone just needs to get better. Yeah. Um, and then to the second question, people would say, well, where should I start? And my answer is always, it depends. And so part of our assessment, we built in an algorithm to help companies understand and identify very um, specifically like what their constraint is. But in, in any case, right, we outline in the book, um, and it's, it's in a couple appendices, what the core capabilities are. And so you can kind of go through, and, and we are going to be including um, additional material that's, that's sort of a rough survey, right, kind of a rough assessment to help organizations understand how am I doing on each of these capabilities and how am I doing on my, on my core outcomes, right? So you know, okay, where am I now, right? Because anytime we measure, right, we, anytime we want to do anything, we should measure. Mm-hmm. Even if it's a rough measurement, where am I now? And um, like, where should I focus? Where should I go? Right? The baseline's important. Even, by the way, anyone out there who just totally sucks, embrace it. Embrace a bad baseline because there's, no, there's nowhere to go but up. And if you have measures that you've been like faking for years, Go ahead and toss them, start over, measure somewhere, identify what your most important capabilities are, focus on those, right? Don't do death by initiative, right? I've worked with a couple companies and they had 50 initiatives. It's not gonna work, right? Pick two, yeah. three, four maybe, like pick a, pick a few, stick with a few, and then improve, and then like remeasure, reassess later. And you can use several different types of of, of measurements and metrics, some survey based. And we talk in the book about why some survey measures are good. Some system based. Mm-hmm. Uh, I have a paper out with, uh, Dr. Mick Kirsten. Uh, it just came out in ACMQ and it'll be coming out in CACM talking about how both of these types of measures are good and valuable to help organizations on this journey because we know it's complex, right? There's so much out there. Yeah, exactly. And I think for our audience, definitely when it comes to measurement and baselining, you've got to know where you are today and where you want to get to tomorrow. Otherwise, you'll just be doing a lot of work and potentially standing still. We are almost out of time, but do we have three minutes for our lightning round, Nicole? Yes, let's do it. Awesome. Let's do this. Question one is, if you could work for any organization at any stage of the company lifecycle, who would it be and at which stage? Okay, I'm sort of liking my company, but I'm going to say that's a cheat. So maybe Netflix early on. Yeah. I just read Powerful by Patty McCord Mm -hmm. and and seeing how they went through and created the culture deck and the culture around Netflix is just like exciting and fun and inspiring and challenging. And so that would be super cool. Yeah. I love their whole um, philosophy that they're a sports team, not a family. Yes. Yes, I love it. So powerful. Question number two, Nicole, is if you could ask anyone a question, dead or alive, who would it be and what would you ask? Oh. Much tougher. (laughs) I know. Okay, you follow it up with a tough one. Oh. Okay, I would, can I ask, can I ask two people the same question if they're standing next to each other? (laughs) I'm sure if physics got them to stand next to each other, sure. Okay, they've worked together. So um, I'm also reading Nudge. I'm, this, is, this is turning into like my book recommendation section. Nudge, um, which looks into behavioral economics. And when I was in my PhD program, I read up on Kahneman and Tversky. And they did a bunch of behavioral economics. And I, I would probably ask them something about, and by, by the way, behavioral economics looks into why and how people are so irrational. Yeah. And I mean that at the economic point of view. Like, we don't make good math-based decisions, right? Like we should never buy lottery tickets. We should also never buy insurance, mm-hmm. right? But we do, right? We're risk averse. We do things that a purely rational-based human wouldn't do. And so I might get Kahneman and Tversky together because they did so much work together and ask them what 
was the tipping point for them to start this work? Or what was the most surprising thing that they found when they were doing some of this work? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I think one of my favorite books is uh, Thinking Fast and Slow. Oh, um, yeah, it's fantastic. You know, systems One and Systems Two Thinking. And that just got me into exploring all the cognitive biases that human beings have and how, like you said, we're quite irrational beings at our core. But um, I think a lot of that goes back to bi- uh, evolutionary biology and so many other things. But absolutely great. I think I'll add the... Um, Mike Lewis the- has a really interesting book coming out called The... Un- or it's out already called The Undoing Project. Uh-huh. And, he, and he talks about... I guess it's about um, Kahneman and Tversky and how they kind of, like, friendship got together. So that one's on my list. Yeah. It's funny because there's a paradox between their work and... A lot of the stuff we're led to believe by economists who say, well, the market is rational and it all evens itself out and, and whatnot, but realistically... If, if humans weren't involved, the market might be rational. Yeah, the exactly. Is there's, there are people. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and that's why you have companies um, who have valuations of something like 400 uh, times, well, 400 times price to earnings valuations, and you think, well, is that really realistic or are we just hoping to cash out before this ship sinks but yeah. anyways <laughs> and lucky last nicole i like to dig into the minds of all of my guests and find out how they stay on top of their games i know you're a you're a crossfitter you like to run um what else do you do whether it's you know meditation or anything else to stay on top of your game um <laughs> i love ice cream i'm gonna ice go with cream. ice cream what kind of flavor <laughs> Right now, my favorite is Hagen dazs caramel cone with fresh raspberries. Awesome, awesome. I'm actually... Yeah, I love, I love good food. <laughs> and right now, my, my vice is probably ice cream. Hey, look, ice cream, I definitely don't knock back an ice cream. I'm, I'm very old school. I like the old school uh, Mr. Whippy ice cream trucks and the rainbow gelati. To me, that oh. just takes me back to being six years old and just being carefree. It's awesome. Oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> I'll try it sometime. Um, Nicole, thank you so much for giving up some time to appear on the show. You've been an awesome guest. People can pick up a copy of Accelerate in late March, but they can pre-order that now on Amazon. So the book is called Accelerate, the Science of Lean Software and DevOps. They can find out more about you at NicoleFB.com. They can find out more about your organization, Dora, at DevOps-research.com. And they can find you on Twitter at NicoleFV. Is there anywhere else they should go? I think that's it. Awesome. Well, my research was conclusive. I'll give myself a pat on the back. And, um, <laughs> Very nice. Thank you so much for giving up some time, Nicole. You've been an awesome guest. Have a great day. Thanks so much for the chat, Steve. Hi, guys. Steve again. Hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you'd like to discuss episodes like this one, request guests for new episodes, propose questions, and access exclusive podcast-related content, join the brand new Future Squared Facebook group. Just search for the Future Squared group on Facebook or visit bit.ly forward slash Future Squared group. That's bit.ly forward slash Future Squared group. If you're picking up what I'm putting down, please take a minute to like, share, or subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or Google Play. It goes a long way to giving the podcast the exposure it needs so I can continue bringing you guests and conversations of the highest caliber. This episode was powered by Collective Campus. Until next time, Future Squared is out.